What Paul is saying, first of all, in this verse is, Jesus is the image or the manifestation or the equal of the invisible God. things appropriately timed, and uh, this morning we're going to talk about a, a, just two thoughts, two thoughts this morning, two things this verse points out, and we'll look at really why. The why of it is just as important as the what of this passage. Colossians 1.15 says this, it's referring to Jesus, okay? Remember what Paul is dealing with. He's dealing with some false teachings of heresy in the church. And particularly, he's dealing with Gnosticism. Alright? 
Gnosticism. G N O S, and you got the rest of it. Ticism. Okay? Uh, Gnosis to know. Knowledge. Knowing. That's the idea behind it. And Paul's having to deal with that here. And the way Paul deals with, with, the, with the lie is to proclaim the truth. Hey, that's a novel approach, isn't it? If you want to dispel a lie, tell the truth to reveal the error of the lie. Alright? That's what Paul does. So look at verse 15. Paul says, refer to Christ, who is the image of the invisible God. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Alright? Now, we're going to look at this morning two thoughts, two things that Paul says about Jesus. Alright? We're going to look at why he says it, and then we're going to be careful not to misunderstand this verse. Alright? So two thoughts, three things about it. Alright. Notice with me here as we begin. As we've said, Paul's addressing an error, false teaching in the church. And to do this, he makes this simple statement in verse 15, referring to Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. Now, the word for image here is where we get our English word icon from. Okay, pretty much that's what the word is in Greek. And so, what is an icon? Well, for those of us that use computers, if you're familiar with an icon, it's the little image on the screen that you click on. So let's say you want to open on your computer, uh, let's say uh, a browser, you want to go on the internet, and so you find the little icon that stands for that, and you click on it, all right? Now that icon is a shortcut, all right? It's called a shortcut for a reason, because back in the day, before we had windows, before we had icons, we had things like DOS, all right, and DOS shell. And what you had to do to launch a program in DOS is you had to type on the command line, the command, the command to open. <laughs> Let there be light. <laughs> it didn't work, it was already light, okay. I'm not going to say let there be darkness, light. Anyway, so back in the day, you had to type out a leaky command. Well, what we do now is we click on that icon. That icon executes that command behind the scenes. You know how to type all that out. Isn't it great? It's wonderful. Yeah, amen. Can you imagine if you had to, you know, every time you want to do something, it would just take forever. Icon is also a terminology used in, in, in certain forms of worship for, for images or statues. They're called icons, religious icons. Well, the word image here, I want us to understand what that means. We're not just talking about a cheap copy of something. We're not just talking about a, a shortcut to something. And what Paul is saying, first of all, in this verse is, Jesus is the image or the manifestation or the equal of the invisible God. That is a bold statement for Paul to make in, in the light of the error that's being taught in the church of Colossae. So Paul says Jesus is the image, the manifestation, the, the equal, if you will. You know, Jesus made it clear when he was here on earth that he was equal with the Father. Now that was a bold claim by Jesus. You know, Jesus put his life on the line when he made statements like that. Uh, when he called God his heavenly Father, uh, to, 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 be, to be equal with God was, was, was something that was, was not allowed. And yet Jesus was bold enough to make the claim. Now Jesus made the claim, it's true, if Paul repeats it, it's for a purpose because of the false teaching. I want you to notice three things, first of all, about Jesus being the image of the invisible God. He says he's the image. Well, notice the two words here. Image, an image is something you can see, right? And then you have that followed by of the invisible God. So Invisible is kind of like the opposite of an image. If something's invisible, you can't see it. If it's the image of something, 
You can see it. But understand the equality that we're talking about here between the image and that which is invisible. The visible and the invisible. All right? That's what we're looking at here. And Paul's using a little play on words to make a point. And we're going to find out why he's making this point. All right? First Timothy chapter 2, uh, verse 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. He is our mediator. Now, Gnosticism held that there were many mediators between God and man. That there were many go-betweens between God and man. That's what Gnosticism taught. And 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, hey, that's not the case. Jesus alone is our mediator. For he is one mediator between God and men. Now, notice with me, secondly, not only did Gnosticism teach that there were, there were many mediators, but Gnosticism also taught that the physical body was purely evil. That this body was evil. Everything about it was evil. Now, there's times we probably feel like this body's evil because it makes us feel bad sometimes. It hurts and it has pain and it lets us down at times. And, and yeah, I mean, we use this physical body. Unfortunately, man uses it to do evil things. Was God intended to be used for righteousness and for good and for his, his praise and his worship? Man uses for another purpose. But Gnosticism taught that the physical body was evil. Now this resulted in two beliefs that flowed out of this teaching of Gnosticism. All right? uh, first of all, there were those that uh, thought the body must be punished or controlled. Okay, Those that lived a, an ascetic lifestyle. Uh, believe the body had to be punished or controlled, or the body must be taken care of as much as possible to keep it from being so evil. All right, you have to take care of it. And so that was one school of thought. You either have to treat the body really badly or treat your body really good, you know, to sort of keep things in check. Then, secondly, the other belief is don't worry about what happens in the body, just take care of the spirit. It doesn't matter what you do in the body. Because your body is one thing, and your spirit is something else. So basically, you can do whatever you want to do in the body, but as long as you believe rightly, your spirit will be in communion with God, and that's what's really important. So those are two beliefs that came out of that teaching of Gnosticism. All right? So you either subject the body to punishment to keep it under control, or you treat it really well. That's one. It's how you treat the body. And the other is, it doesn't matter what you do in the body. The spirit's what's important. Only what goes on inside is of any real matter to God. Okay? And so those two things float out of that. There's a third teaching of Gnosticism that's important. And that is that the way to God was through certain knowledge or certain words. Okay? There were certain things that you needed to know. Certain words that you were able to say. Uh, to achieve closeness or oneness with God. So this is what's being taught in the church at Colossae. And Paul, as he, as he begins to address this, he addresses it with a simple statement in verse 15. Christ is the image of the invisible God, and he is the firstborn of every creature. That's what we need to know. That is the truth that is important. Paul addresses these false beliefs by the simple statement. Because, notice this, if Jesus is the image, the manifestation, the embodiment of the invisible God, He is now the visible of the invisible God, then the body cannot be purely evil because God cannot be connected with evil and yet Christ was born in a human body. So Paul is addressing the false teaching by making this simple statement. And really, it's, it's really ingenious, it's straight, it's to the point, and it's concise. But let me ask you a question today. If Paul addresses this false teaching that's taking place, I think that gives us a good indication that we have to keep our eyes open today for false teaching as well. Amen? Amen. Because there's a lot of false teaching that goes on under the banner of Christianity or within Christendom. And it's just not biblical. 
It's just not biblical. In fact, some of the teachings that Paul dealt with in that day are still around today. Think about the idea of, of the body, okay? The idea that, well, you either abuse the body to keep it under subjection or you do whatever you want to do, right? Because it doesn't really matter. Listen, that part of it is still alive today. It doesn't matter what you do in the body. As long as you think the right way, as long as you believe the right way, you can do whatever you want to do. Well, let me ask you a question this morning. Do we not act out of what we truly believe? I think we do. I think that what a person says they believe, yes, that's important. But the way a person lives, I believe, really tells you what they believe. Because our actions take so much more energy than our words. And they flow out of who we are. We can say words to please other people. But we're going to live, most people are going to live in a way that pleases themselves. So if they really believe that they can do whatever and live any kind of way and still have a good relationship with God, then that flows out of a belief system. Okay? But if a person believes that God in His Word has said and that it matters what we do in this body and they live according to that, then that flows out of their belief system as well. So the words that we say, while they're important, uh, I think do not carry as much weight as the actions that we do, the life that we live. Because they flow out of what's inside us. Okay? And so Paul addresses that here. And we also have to be careful today to keep our eyes open for false teachings. Now, that's number one. Number two. All right? Jesus is the firstborn above all things. All right? This is where we have to be careful not to misunderstand this verse. The Bible says he is the firstborn of every creature. Now, there came a teaching in the church that believed that Jesus was a created being. That you, because of passages like this. But that's not what this passage is saying. Jesus was not a created being. All right? The word firstborn here has a meaning. It means priority, superiority, and preeminence. He was not the first created. He was the originator. Okay? You go back to Genesis 1-1, and you look at how creation took place. You've got the Father, you got the Son, and you got the Holy Spirit taking part. Okay? Jesus was there. He's not a created being. He is in the Godhead. There's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right? Now, throughout the church age, there's been times where they have understood this differently. There have been um, some of the early church fathers have a different understanding of the Trinity than what we have today. But they basically held to the teaching of the Trinity. They envisioned it a little different. Differently. One of my favorite, uh, one of the ones I used to love to read after was named Tertullian. Uh, Tertullian, I just, he was a lawyer back in, uh, in, in the early days. I, I, I can't remember when Tertullian lived. Maybe it was in the 200s or 100s or something like that. I can't remember. But anyway, his understanding of the Trinity was very different from the way I understand the Trinity. Okay? Uh, he saw the Trinity as emanations out of one another. The Father, out of the Father, emanating the Son, and out of the Son, emanating the Spirit. And we picture it sometimes like a triangle. There's no perfect representation. We don't have a perfect representation of the Trinity. We have ways to try to understand it. And one day we will fully understand it. But while the understanding of the Trinity may have changed a little bit down through the ages, Jesus is God. Bible says in Hebrews 1.3, Christ, speaking of Christ, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews 1.3. You see, Jesus, when he says that he is the firstborn uh, of every creature. He is above. He is supreme. He has supremacy above every created thing. We need to understand that. Why did Paul do this? Paul did this to address the false teaching in the church of Colossae. And friends, I think within this, not only do we need to know the truth, but we need to keep our eyes open. We need to keep our ears open. Because every popular thing that comes along on Facebook 
and on TikTok and on Instagram that is Christian. It's not always biblical. It's not always biblical. So we need to keep our eyes open for that and be on guard. Why? Because God holds us responsible for that. You say, well, how in the world can I how can I be on guard? How can I know? How, how can I judge these things rightly? Stay in his word and rely upon the Holy Spirit. Stay in his word and rely upon the Holy Spirit. Listen, the Bible is not just a book to be read. It's a book to be studied. It's a book to be learned. And it is a book to know. It is, it is, it is living. It is alive. And it does something in us as believers. With the Holy Spirit. And you know what? God will make error apparent to us if we stay in his word and we rely upon him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Don't get used to these quick sermons like last Sunday and this Sunday, okay? I'm just saying, it hurts me to do this. I'm just telling you, it's painful. All right? But anyway, let me leave you with that thought. As critical as we are to certain things in life, I'll give you a quick illustration. If you go buy a car, especially a used car, you normally check it out. You go, you see the ad, the guy says, hey, this car is in great shape. I drive it to California today. You say, oh, that's good enough for me. It's mine. Here's cash on the barrel head. Right here, I'm taking it home. I don't even need to crank it, right? Don't even need to hear it run. Right. Let's sign the papers. Now, how many of us are going to do that? No. We're going to at least crank it. We're going to kick the tires, as we used to say. We're going to drive it a little bit. We're going to listen for sounds, right? Or we're going to take it to a mechanic that we trust, have them check it out. But we're going to get some sort of, there's going to be some measure of, of uh, criticism of that, of that vehicle. It's going, to, it's going to take effect. We're going to prove it, if you will. Same is true in our lives spiritually. Listen, everything that comes along, we need to prove it. We need to make sure it's sound. We need to make sure it's biblical. And we need to make sure it is of God. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your blessing, your goodness. We thank you for your word as we read in this verse today, as the Apostle Paul has, has given to the church in Colossae, so he gives to us today a simple truth of who Jesus is. This is the person of Christ. He, he is the image of the invisible God. He, he came from that which man cannot see in a form that they could see. And he said, I and the, and the Father our one. What a statement. What a statement. We claim equality with God. We need to know who Jesus is. We need to be aware. Because if there's false teaching, we need to stay away from it. We need to identify. It. We need to call out. Father, I pray that you would help us to be faithful to your word to be faithful to the leading of your spirit, to trust in you for all things. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with us as we have this song of invitation.